go ahead and call our meeting to order here. First, I want to say thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, this is a committee hearing for the Senate Commerce Committee. There's a subcommittee uh, called Communications, Technology, and the Internet. So this is the a, an official subcommittee meeting. Uh, we're following all the protocol that we use in the Senate. So let me just say thank you for everyone who's here in attendance, especially for our panelists and all the things that uh, you're going to talk about today. Uh, the title for this hearing is called Connecting Urban and Rural America, the State of Communications on the Ground. And before I say another word, I want to thank the Arkansas Electric Cooperatives for allowing us to use their facilities today. Not only are they beautiful, but they are very functional. And we are very appreciative uh, to Katrina Whalen, who I saw earlier. She's the first person I saw when I walked in. And also Carmi Henry, of course, who's uh, been at the co-ops for a long time and always does uh, great things. But I want to thank the Arkansas Electric Cooperatives, as well as Dwayne and many others who I've met here today and just say thank you. Also, a special welcome to FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel, who's here. And she's going to stay here on the panel, so to speak, and um, certainly we would love to uh, get her thoughts and insights as we go. Um, you know, the, the nation's uh, communication sector is the most dynamic and innovative part of our economy, whether it's things like traditional wireline or wireless or broadcasters, cable, satellite, or some mixture of those things. Uh, lots of investment, lots of innovation, and um, it's been amazing to watch and amazing to see. We have a lot of people sitting around this room uh, who really uh, will play an extremely important part in Arkansas's future to make sure that we uh, get this technology here in our state. And that, that kind of goes to really the driving mission, one of the central challenges uh, that we have on the CTI subcommittee and something that I take very personally, and that is how do we make sure that these great, cutting-edge, amazing services reach everyone? Uh, not only urban areas, but also rural areas, and also people that either maybe don't have the economic ability or maybe have a disability of some sort or another. How do we make sure that it reaches everyone? And I think one of the things we do not want to see is we do not want to see the tale of two Americas where you have urban and suburban America that have the latest and greatest and best technology and they have the investment and the innovation and all those good things and then you get rural America who's just left behind with second rate, third rate uh, telecommunication services. That's not good for rural America but really it's not good for anyone. And as we go through the day, we're going to hear things about why this is important uh, and why uh, the, the Congress should continue to create conditions for things like job creation, uh, innovation, investment, um, and other aspects that telecommunications brings with it. So I'm proud to be the chairman of the subcommittee. Just for the folks in the room from Arkansas who haven't participated in these in Washington, we've had four what we call state of hearings. And so the idea was this year to start the year with four, these four state of hearings. So we had the state of rural communications, the state of video, state of wireless, and the state of wire line. And we brought a lot of people together to look at the marketplace, look at the regulatory environment. Um, we uh, were able to, um, uh, you know, talk about this nationally, get the big picture view of this. But today's hearing is really the culmination of those four hearings in the sense that Arkansas is a great microcosm that we can really look at this in more detail, in a, in a, in a more granular way, because we have in this state all those same challenges. We, we have the urban and versus the rural. We have, you know, income complexities. We have things like the diversity of terrain, uh, just you know, challenges uh, left and right to make sure that we do this right. But the great thing about Arkansas is we have people here on the ground who are very, very committed to making it run and run right and run well. 
Um, so I would say if you think about telecommunications and the impact that it has on all of our lives, it's pretty astounding. I mean, it's as simple as just calling a friend and talking, you know, about what's going on there or a loved one, something like that, all the way to making those 911 and other emergency calls that when you absolutely need it, you have to have it because it really does save lives. And, you know, and there's a lot of things in between about watching local news, local sports, uh, just being involved with your community and find out what's going on there. People are taking classes online. They're conducting more and more business online. Now with, with all these new technologies, you can have a tablet, you can watch local TV on your tablet, you can stream movies. I mean, it's just this never ending uh, series of uh, applications, this technology that really is impacting uh, lives. And it's not just a luxury. Um, it, it's something again that's uh, become extremely important in our economy. And one thing that we need to remember that, to, that now economic growth is gonna be tied to this and economic opportunity we want to see Arkansas stay competitive. We want to continue creating jobs. We want to continue to see us improve education, improve health care. And this is one of the real levelers when it comes to providing cutting edge, best in class rural health care. But also uh, this, this comes to, to safety and keeping people safe and being able to do things that we've re really never been able to do before. So. Um, here again, you look at Arkansas, we've got this great ecosystem here. We've got a, people that know each other, that want to work together, want to get it done. We have really large companies that are doing business here, and we have really small companies. We have a Fortune 500 company that's based here. We have innovative people. And as I said before, we have lots of challenges. So let me just run through our, our three panels very quickly and tell you uh, how we're, we're setting up today. Uh, the first uh, panel is designed to understand the benefits of broadband and the status of its deployment and adoption across the state. The second and third panels will be uh, from the wireless and wireline providers, broadcasters, and other media representatives uh, working to bring services to Arkansas. And then at the end of today's hearing, you know, the goal is that we'd have a more thorough understanding of the national and state challenges and that we would, that I would know what needs to be done to not just improve telecommunications for the end user, but also to create this environment where we continue to see the innovation in all the things that, um, uh, that, that you know, that this technology promises. So again, I want to thank all of you all again, and we're going to uh, go with our testimony in just a minute. But first, I wanted to introduce our FCC Commissioner, Je Jessica Rosen Wurzel, uh, she was on the uh, Senate Commerce Committee staff, and she and I worked on at least one piece of legislation that was signed into law by the President, but actually we worked on several pieces of legislation, and she's been very, very good on the FCC, and let me turn the microphone over to her. Oh, thank you, Senator Pryor. Thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a treat to be here in Arkansas. So I've been a commissioner at the FCC for a little over a year. But I've actually worked on communications and rural communications for many years. In fact, before making my way to the commission, as the senator just said, I worked up on Capitol Hill as senior communications counsel to the Senate Commerce Committee. So in that role, I had the opportunity to work with Senator Pryor, and I know firsthand how he puts the people of Arkansas first. But more than that, I know he knows how important it is for all Americans, no matter who they are, or where they live to have access to modern communications. And if you want proof, you can look at his leadership in the passage of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. It's a law that extends access to digital age communications to all Americans, including those with disabilities. Now he won't brag, that's probably not the Arkansas way, but I will. Because of this law, he's actually responsible for one of the biggest and most substantial communications laws in decades. So it is a treat to be here, and I thank him and the subcommittee. And I would looking forward to hear directly from people who work hard every day to make sure that all Americans are connected. Because on this front, we have made real progress. 
In fact, more than 80% of American households in this country now have access to broadband at 100 megabits. The United States leads the world in fourth generation LTE wireless deployment. And carriers serving rural America have made real gains in some of our most remote communities. And this progress has created opportunities for businesses, for jobs, for education, for healthcare, and for civic life. But there's no rest for the weary because laurels are not in fact good resting places. Time is marching on and technology advances and every day there's work to do to make sure that rural America is not left behind. This is true right here in Arkansas and the FCC data demonstrate that with clarity. It tells us that over 13% of those in Arkansas lack access to broadband and in rural areas the number's even higher. Moreover, across the state, broadband adoption is just about 48%. So we have work to do. Because it's important that nobody in this state or this country is consigned to the wrong side of the digital divide. Now at the FCC, we have a range of programs and policies that can help if we do our jobs right. We have upcoming spectrum auctions that can extend the reach of wireless broadband service to more rural areas. We have ongoing work on the IP transition, which is an effort to foster investment in next generation networks across the country. We have a universal service fund to help support communications in rural areas. But we need to make sure recent updates to this program help and not hurt rural deployment. We're updating our E-rate program that connects schools and libraries to the internet. And this is especially exciting because I think if we change its focus from just connection to capacity, we're gonna make real progress with digital age education. Finally, we have also updated our policies to support rural telemedicine through our Healthcare Connect Fund. And I think this is a good thing, not just for healthcare, it's gonna help further with rural broadband deployment. So we have a lot going on, a lot of work to do, but Washington is awfully long on talk and short on listening. So today I want to flip that script, and I want to listen to you, and I want to learn. So thank you for having me here, and I look forward to your testimony. Mr. Walls, if you don't mind, why don't we start with you and just go around the, the table this way. How does that sound for simplicity? Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for the opportunity to present today. Uh, my name is Sam Walls, and I am Senior Vice President with Arkansas Capital Corporation and President of Connect Arkansas, which is a 501c3 private nonprofit with a mission to prepare the people and businesses of Arkansas to secure the economic, educational, health, social, and other benefits available via broadband use. Uh, we've been primarily funded through two grants, the 2009 Recovery Act, uh, NTIA, Broadband Technology Operations Program, as well as some state matching funds and some contributions from pro uh, service providers. We're not a service provider, so our focus has been solely based on the idea of driving people, how do, why are people not adopting the internet, and how can we help overcome those obstacles? Through our surveys and eat re outreach, we know, we kind of broadly put those in two boxes. We all talk about accessibility and lack of broadband education. From the accessibility side, first question obviously is, do Arkansans have access to internet? And working with service providers over the last several years, we've pr produced a pretty accurate coverage map that tells us if you take out satellite internet, 98% of our Kansans have access to broadband internet. Take out wireless broadband, that drops to 92%. So on the face, those statistics would show at least from the ability to get on that a majority of our Kansans have it. To be fair, the definition of broadband in that one is 768 kilobits per second download. So it, there would be an argument to be made whether that is, some people certainly would say that's not sufficient for a lot of today's applications, but that's the definition we've used. Uh, from our surveys, we do know that in some areas of the state, speed and reliability are still an issue. Uh, we then ask, okay, if they have access, what other barriers to keep them offline are? And, and clearly the two big ones are cost of service and cost of equipment to get online. And cost of service is, again, going to be driven in large part by what type of technology you're trying to utilize, where you're located, and how much competition is in that particular footprint. And then buying the equipment is as simple as, obviously, some families at a median uh, income level are such they can't make that initial investment to get online. 
Go on to the next one. It's all right. So you have the access issue. What is the other piece that's keeping people offline? And that's where we go lack of broadband education. And we kind of break that into two categories. It's those that say question the relevancy of it and still in their life. And then there's those that they know that it's relevant, but they're intimidated by the process. Certainly a lot of our older Arkansans may fall into that box. Uh, through our grants, Connect has tried to identify these things and have come up with various ways to try to help people overcome these, to explain the relevancy, to, uh, to teach them and work with other groups to get them comfortable with this, the Internet. Uh, in my last few seconds here, you know, a lot of the conversation is and will continue to be on the delivery, delivery, delivery platform side, how much money we spend to expand access, to expand speeds, and, and certainly that's the larger question. We, however, have seen the value with the grassroots type initiatives that what we do on that end, and we would ask that, you know, as you look, continue going forward and look to put resources to it, it's a phenomenal ROI to continue to put forth this grassroots effort to support those type of things that Connect and other groups have done. We're certainly not the only one in this box. And not only build it from the outside, but help us push the adoption from the inside. And, and the analogy that's been used often is, it is the same efforts that were years ago on the rural electrification and getting people to adopt just basic electricity in their homes. It's the same thing here, and this thing will grow faster and get the benefits quicker if we attack this on both ends. Do appreciate your time today. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pryor, for the opportunity to come today. It was almost six years ago to the day that we were before you for an FCC commission meeting talking about the future of health care and where technology could take it. Uh, my boss, Dr. Curtis Lowry, and Tina Benton presented that day uh, six years ago. Uh, I can tell you we have good news. Uh, Margaret Mead wrote, never doubt what a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. We were a small group of 10 individuals sitting around a table dreaming of how we could help health care here in the state of Arkansas better serve our not only uh, urban areas but our rural areas as well. I can proudly say on August 1st, 2010, the UMS Center for Distance Health was awarded $102 million uh, for the deployment of a healthcare educational video imaging and data network later known or now known as Arkansas eLink. Sitting around, it was a daunting task sitting around as a small group knowing that other individuals like AT&T, Windstream, Suddenlink, and the, the, our partners that are sitting here today were probably doing the same thing, but we knew something had to change here in the state of Arkansas with healthcare. We can say today that every county in the state is now part of this eLink network. Uh, every hospital in the state is now part of this. Every four-year, uh, which Mr. Merrifield will talk about, institution and two-year colleges, human development centers, federally qualified community health centers, mental health clinics, home health agencies, all came together here in the state of Arkansas to be able to accomplish this uh, major task of being able to uh, be connected. Now, this was built on other things that already existed, such as our ANGELS program, which took care of high-risk OB patients by using video technology so the moms could stay closer to their local provider to get their ultrasounds, to have access to four uh, maternal fetal medicine subspecialists across the state. Currently, we have 23 clinics that are going, and we do over 3,000 consults a year. So these high-risk moms are getting their care closer to home. Built upon that also because it was working, Arkansas is also, uh, healthcare-wise, was ranked 53rd in 2009 in stroke mortality. 53rd. That mean even Puerto Rico beat us. That's not good. So now, through this network, we are covering 41 hospitals across the state and their emergency department, again, with four vascular neurologists that are being able to give TPA clot-busting drug to patients who need it. Does this make a difference? Absolutely. We are now delivering where we used to deliver TPA less than 1% of the time. We are now delivering this drug to over 30% of our patients that we're getting consults on. And this means better outcomes and not going to nursing homes or funeral homes, but actually going home. And this doesn't matter if you live in Osceola, DeWitt, and Helena, because we also service hospitals in El Dorado, Hot Springs, and Fayetteville. I can report to you, Senator Pryor, that as of September 30th, 2013, the Arkansas E-Link project will be fully deployed and all money spent according to the terms of the grant by the NTIA. In closing, Arkansas is now one of the top connected telehealth educational states in the country. We are not below, we are in one of the top five. We're not ranked 49th or 50th in this, uh, in what we're doing with healthcare and education. This project builds upon relationships that we appreciate, technology, and of course the support within the healthcare community with one unifying theme that we continue to be held by all as we continue farther. 
where you live shouldn't determine whether you live or whether you die. And we wake up every morning knowing we have much more work to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Merrifield. Well, thank you for <coughs> excuse me, the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. My name is David Merrifield. I'm the Executive Director of the Arkansas Research and Education Optical Network, or ARON. ARON is a not-for-profit consortium uh, created to apply advanced communications technologies to support and elevate education, research, and economic development in Arkansas. We were first established in 2008, and our members include all of the state's public four-year universities and nearly two dozen two-year community colleges. ARON operates a high-speed optical network that connects all of our university and college members. Our network utilizes over 2,200 miles of dark fiber, much of which is provided by uh, commercial providers throughout the state uh, through long-term capital leases. An important distinction about ARON is that we own and operate the equipment that light the fiber rather than purchasing that service through uh, typical and traditional communication services. This gives us enormous flexibility to uniquely tailor our network to the often demanding needs of the community of higher education institutions that we represent. ARON delivers extremely high speed broadband access to its members with speeds up to 10 gigabits per second and discussions today are in, uh, underway for 100 gigabits per second. Our members receive general commodity internet access, as well as connections to national research and education networks such as Internet2 and the National Lambda Rail. ARON enables the development and use of applications that leverage the high-speed network to do research and education in new and innovative ways. Broadband access without limitations permits our users to find new approaches to educational and research challenges and to collaborate with their peers and colleagues nationally and internationally. As a subrecipient of the $102 million NTIA BTOP grant received by the University of Arkansas system in 2010, ARON expanded its fiber optic network to connect the two-year community colleges throughout the state and to provide infrastructure over which, as Mr. Manley has stated, the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences has connected over 450 healthcare institutions statewide to form the Arkansas E-Link network. ARON would not be possible today without access to dark fiber from its commercial providers. <clears throat> it's our opinion that public policy and funding for national and state broadband initiatives should leverage public-private partnerships. Our investments have substantially benefited our providers by enabling them to construct more fiber, uh, to reach more customers, to access more affordable telecommunications and internet services, and to provide, or provide better rates and service to their customers. It's been my honor to provide testimony, and I'll be glad to answer any questions as arise. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Harriman? Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak on behalf of FAST Access for students, teachers, and economic results for Arkansas. For the last several years, I've been working with Governor Mike Beebe's Workforce Cabinet on the STEMWorks initiative. But we have found that schools that wanted to participate in STEMWorks sometimes couldn't because they lacked adequate broadband. So we started looking at broadband capacity around the entire state. How did we fare? The short answer was not well. Last year, the 2012 Digital Learning Now report from the Foundation for Educational Excellence in Education gave Arkansas an F for digital learning opportunities. TechNet's 2012 Broadband Index listed Arkansas as 50th among all states for broadband access. The Arkansas Association for Educational Administrators surveyed its members in 2011 and found that 78% wanted to implement technology initiatives but couldn't due to bandwidth limitations. Preparing students to be competitive in the 21st century global economy is an imperative in any state, but in states with many poor and rural students, 21st century schools not only prepare the workforce, but help reduce the, bur the burden of poverty and isolation. Arkansas faces the same challenges as other rural states working to increase broadband access. 
Service providers see expanding to low population density areas as cost prohibitive. Construction and monthly service costs are too high for small communities to absorb. Local network infrastructure may be outdated and there is a lack of sufficient technical expertise at the local level. However, none of that is stopping the state from moving forward. The General Assembly passed Act 1280 of 2003 that requires high schools to offer one or more digital learning courses beginning in 2014 and 15. The legislation also directs the state to study the broadband necessary to deliver quality digital learning. The report to the legislative leadership is due December of this year. Faster Arkansas was formed at the request of Governor Beebe and includes representatives from cable, telephone, and fixed wireless companies, secondary and post-secondary education, <laughs> each of Arkansas's United States senators, and maybe most importantly, industry and business leaders who recognize that the development of a strong broadband public policy is vital not only for the educational advancement of our students, but is also vital for the economic growth and advancement of our state. By working together, we believe that FASTER can put forth, in a unified voice, public policy proposals to be considered by both the legislative and executive branches of our government. Arkansas is moving forward and making process, progress, but we need help. Arkansas needs access to funding for the middle and last mile build out access to funds to build and upgrade local area networks and provide technical support, a simplified revenue stable E-rate program that prioritizes applications for regional educational consortiums, including Arkansas educational cooperatives, and ongoing support for digital learning. Mr. Chairman, many of our districts are losing residents. When this happens, students either miss out on opportunities to take high-level courses or districts are forced to consolidate. This endangers the rural way of life and limits economic opportunities for our state. Broadband expansion offers ways to stem the tide and Faster Arkansas is committed to being part of the solution. Thank you for your interest in this important issue. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Zimmerman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to participate in my dual role as a commissioner on the Arkansas Economic Development Commission and also as a broadband provider in rural north central Arkansas through my family company, Yelcock Communications. Uh, I appreciate you holding this field hearing back in Arkansas also where the businesses run the gamut from small mom and pop all the way up to the world's largest retailer. Uh, every entity throughout this gamut relies not only on the availability of broadband networks, but also their robustness and reliability. And beyond the business world where the AEDC focuses, the sectors of government, medicine, ed education, agriculture and nonprofits have similar requirements. AEDC's primary goal is recruitment of new businesses to the state and the retention and expansion of those already here. And in recent years, redundant fiber networks have become as important to business site selection experts as redundant power supplies. Businesses need to retain connectivity to internal and web-based networks on a continual and reliable basis. And it's not just big businesses, small rural firms making niche products without a brick and mortar storefront rely on their websites for order taking, processing, and delivery. If the internet is down, their entire business is down because their, all their sales are online. An excellent example is the pending Big River Steel Mill in Osceola, Arkansas. Uh, this project represents a $1.1 billion investment in Arkansas and the promised creation of 525 jobs with an average salary of $75,000 a year. In talking to the AEDC project manager in preparation for this hearing, I made the comment that Big River Steel probably didn't have a big need for broadband. I learned in a hurry that the mill is being constructed by the German steel mill specialist company, SMS CMOG, whose engineers will be performing diagnostic testing and receiving online streams of reports from the mill equipment here in Arkansas. Speaking now as a provider, I can tell you that the recent changes to the Federal Universal Service Fund, USF, and the Intercarrier Compensation, or ICC, mechanisms have put a big damper on the expansion of broadband investment from telephone companies like Yelcott. The FCC's USF and ICC transformation order and subsequent follow-on proceedings have, or are proposed to, significantly changed how rural rate of return telecom providers recover their costs. 
Some of the reforms proposals, proposals include caps on costs that can be included in the calculation of USF support, phased down payments from long distance providers for access to the local network, increased broadband requirements, and reduction in the rate of return that companies are authorized to earn on their investments. The caps depend not just on investments in individual companies make, but also on what, what investment is made by other companies across the country. A company has no way of knowing if any investment puts them in a position to be capped and lose support. In addition, the FCC has begun the process of reevaluating the rate of return that rural telephone companies are authorized to earn on their investment, including a proposed significant reduction in the current authorized rate of return. This lack of predictability in the application of the new caps on support and the reduction in revenue makes investment risky and has started a race to the bottom rather than give companies the regulatory certainty we need to make the enhancements to our broadband networks that are necessitated by the transformation order. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for giving me this opportunity to address the committee. Thank you. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and talk about agriculture and how it benefits from rural broadband. I'm the Associate Director of Governmental Affairs for Arkansas Farm Bureau and a cow-calf producer myself. Agriculture is Arkansas's largest industry. For agriculture to continue to lead our state's economy, it needs viable rural communities to supply the needs, services needed to support their families and small businesses. No different than the 1930s with the need of electricity and telephone services in rural areas, which was accomplished by a successful public-private partnership. The obstacle then was the problem of distribution. How could we get the much needed electricity and telephone service to homes in rural areas? The problem of access is the same for rural broadband. To thrive, rural areas need access to health care, government services, and educational and business opportunities. Precision agriculture technologies have made farmers more efficient today. The use of GPS and auto steel steer guidance systems are two types of precision agriculture used to increase crop yields, lower cost, and reduce chemical use, which benefits the environment. The two types of technology works together, helping farmers identify precisely where to plant seeds and how many seeds, and if needed, apply variable rates of pesticides and fertilizer. Auto steer on tractors is not hands-free, but it allows farmers to drive equipment in straight lines while reducing fatigue. It also ensures consistency when different people take turns in the driver's seat. Livestock sector also utilizes technology and has increasing needs for better services. Today, poultry farmers use monitoring systems to provide added protection for birds. Cattle are being sold through the video auctions and the ability to place bids from your smartphone or computers. The online marketplace has a great impact of the cattle industry. Farmers are able to research information about herd management and cattle markets. It is fair to say that farmers now buy and sell cattle all over our country. With online access, the perfect herd sire might be found hundreds of miles away. The internet also allows cattlemen to find the right point of sale for their animals going to market. With the local auctions disappearing, this has never been more important than today. In order to get high quality, affordable service to the last mile, there must be cooperations between public and private interest. It is important that we continue to work together to resolve the issues that hinder the internet service for all rural Arkansans. Thank you for having us this morning. Thank you. And Mr. Hall, let me start my first question with you. You talk about, you know, agriculture is our number one industry. You talk about the innovations and the, the new technologies that are there. Is it a hindrance uh, for farmers around the state, you know, no matter what kind of farm they are, to live in a rural area if they can't have access to the internet? I believe that it would be a hindrance for them to increase their production and become a f more efficient. So we need to continue that. I know in certain places in Arkansas, it's easier to get the type of high quality service that they can utilize that, those technologies so that they can grow. Uh, margins in agriculture is extremely narrow and for the precision agriculture um, to really reduce that uh, and be able to farm more acres, uh, I think would be a benefit. And I assume you're just going to see technology continue to grow in agriculture. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah. 
Mr. Zimmerman, let me ask you, you mentioned the Big River Steel project, and given your work on AEDC, um, how often do these companies that you're recruiting and that you're talking to, how often do they mention the, the need for broadband, and you know why is that so important to them? I, I tell you, I, I talked with the staff uh, before the hearing just to get a, an idea from the actual staffers that deal with business recruitment on a global basis. How, and that exact question, how often do these companies ask about broadband? Is it half the time? And, and uh, the word I got back was it's a lot more than half the time. And what they're particularly interested in is uh, redundant networks so that if uh, a cut is made going east of town, they can still route traffic out to the west. And uh, the redundancy uh, really adds to the reliability. You still see newspaper or, or hear a uh, TV stories these days about uh, a single fiber cut in between city X and city Y knocks out a telephone, cable, and internet service for hundreds or thousands of people for 10 to 12 hours at a time because they got to go splice that thing back. We had something happen in uh, outside of Stone County in Mountain View, Arkansas, where we had a major fiber running through there and it got cut in the middle of the night and we, we don't know of any construction going on. And it turned out a farmer his dog died. He went out with a backhoe to dig a grave for the dog and dug up our fiber, buried the dog, and we had to go and find where the loose dirt was to get fiber right. turned back onto these people. So that's why it's important to have these redundant routes out. Yeah, interesting. Um, <clears throat> okay, so so you so this has become a a major component part of getting companies to locate here and keeping them here. And Absolutely. Keep them the reliability or the ability to have a ring around the metropolitan areas or where they're looking to uh, locate is very essential to mm -hmm. them. Ms. Harriman, let me ask you, I know that in Arkansas, uh, obviously economic development is important, but a big piece of that is also education. You know, that there's, there's a direct tie there. And your group is working uh, apparently very well and making good progress and you're moving forward and all that's very exciting and it looks like you know you're going to continue to do good things there but um, let me ask about the uh, the the e-rate program that I know the FCC is discussing right now um, are there changes that you would like to see that would benefit Arkansas in the e-rate program very much so um, uh, I just started learning about E-Rate in, um, in March when this problem emerged uh, in our office. And um, one of the first things I did was ask for a copy of the state's E-Rate application. And um, it was over 300 pages and took months and months and months of work. I think Becky Rains is here who helps put that together. Um, there's five or six forms that have to be turned in at certain deadlines. and. Um, and, and not only is, is the paperwork um, very hard to understand and, and the process is very difficult, but um, the actual follow through and not, and not knowing whether or not what you want to have funded is going to even be funded and then having to have the seed money uh, to get the rebate back, the, the whole, it, it seems, um, like a very uh, huge barrier for districts and for states to have to uh, deal with as they're trying to increase access to broadband. Okay. Did you want to, I know you guys have that, that you're, it's kind of, I guess, are y'all in the process of revisiting that right now, the E-rate? Uh, yeah, E-rate's a wonderful program. It is a tremendous equalizer for small and rural schools to be able to get high-speed broadband. Mm -hmm. But we do have a problem, and you hit the nail on the head. It, we've made the program so complicated that small and rural schools are having a hard time applying. So it's my hope as we revisit this program this year, we're going to address that head on. Thank you. Mr. Merrifield, let me ask you a kind of a related question, and that is um, your uh, program that you talked about, Auron. Um, what, what do we need to see just to continue to have are on get stronger and more relevant and you know just continue to move in the right direction we have a significant infrastructure that's state-based and state-funded in place 
and certainly that infrastructure should be leveraged to its greatest degree for any efforts that have to do with public policy or public uh, funding here in Arkansas. Uh, you know, our focus is on higher education today. There are great needs in many other areas, and so I would offer that uh, the Arkansas Research and Education Optical Network should provide infrastructure in some fashion to help alleviate some of the problems we have here in the state. And so for your average student, does that mean, is this, as part of this, that they can take classes online? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, so the, the, the broadband that we provide our colleges and universities are really just part of the problem. You know, the other half of that is students who live at home who need to take courses, need to have access to broadband to be able to uh, get video content or courseware content from their local colleges or even colleges across the state. And so we're only a part of the solution and that, uh, you know, the broadband development that we have done has enabled, through our funding, has enabled uh, local providers or other uh, providers that are represented in this room to increase the size and improve their networks so that they can provide better service to their, uh, their subscribers. Ms. Walls, let me ask you, because Mr. Merrifield's touching on something that you said in your testimony there are a lot of uh, people in our state that may have access to broadband, and again, some of that's going to be a definition of broadband and what's adequate, but nonetheless, they have access, but they, they don't utilize it. Uh, and, and tell us why they don't utilize it, and what can we do to try to make sure that if, if they want it, they can have access to it? Well, it, again, uh, they don't access this, let's assume for a moment. I mean, the things we've done at Connect, taking the next step, I mean, and pricing, those are the conversations you're having right now. And again, as networks expand, uh, I think those, those issues start resolving themselves. You, you actually see service providers now doing some programs and, and advertising them to help people, you know, low-income people get access. So I think it's a need that we're starting to recognize, get our hands around things we've done. And so again, you've seen these around the nation on the equipment where we've done uh, free or reduced cost refurb computers to kids on uh, free reduced lunch programs. So I think there's a lot of opportunities there to try to, you know, those specific ones on access. Then you go on the other side, the lack of broadband education. Um, it is you know, for those that want to do it but are intimidated by the process, uh, again, it's, it's outreach to those particular groups. It's working with groups like uh, the Farm Bureau group and, and classes and things along those lines to farmers looking to how do we use this technology better, um, senior citizens groups. Uh, the school system, you know, hopefully it's improving within the school system so the, the younger generation is getting a lot of access to it. But for a state like Arkansas that has unfortunately a, a large percentage of people with only a high school education that have since gra graduated before really the computer generation a lot of them and they're not necessarily using them in their jobs so how do we find those opportunities to find the relevancy in their life to show hey this is something that's interesting it, it can be as simple candidly I mean hunting uh, you know getting licenses online I mean you got to find for us connect it's I think kind of the mantra, give us five minutes and we'll figure out where it's relevant in your life for someone that's adamant where it's not. And so you, you try to push it from that side on the, on the equation. And it's a, it's a process. Again, it's a grassroots type effort. But uh, again, it yields a pretty good dividend on our end as far as you know, getting that take rate up. And I think any service provider would tell you, particularly in some of these more rural areas, that hey, if we can get better take rates, it certainly gives a nice incentive to maybe improve what we're able to do, maybe bring in more competition. And, and remind the committee again what the take rate is in Arkansas. Uh, you know, it depends on what number you're in. I think you use the 40-something percent. We, we actually have a 70, uh, I think it's like 78 percent, but that's it when you include mobile wireless and, and you get into, it depends on what numbers you want to use. Uh, but uh, I think yours for the wire line, it's, it, it's below 50 percent. So, but in some communities, it's, heck, it's, you know, it's 10 percent, it's 12 percent. It's way below what we need it to be. And I go back to the economic development statement. Um, it's you're hearing from the ADC is hearing from the companies that say, look at us and say, okay, is there a broadband? I think from a larger perspective, uh, uh, the maybe the uh, perception of Arkansas is driven at part. If someone from another state looks and maybe has a preconceived notion of what Arkansas is or is not because of our history or we're in the South or whatever, the things that come along with regionalism. Uh, and then you look and you see a, a take rate at 45, 46 percent. 
um, that may reinforce a particular perception that maybe even before they'd even consider, they wouldn't even consider coming here. And I think if you can improve those type of numbers, you maybe have the opportunity to, again, shatter some perceptions of what Arkansas is or is not, and maybe have more people look at us as an opportunity to do business here. And part, part of this is the <clears throat> available of tech, uh, the availability of technology, but part of it is just the cost to the end user, right? It's just hard for a lot of our, our people in this state to afford. It is. You know, just bottom line. Uh, let me, Mr. Manley, let me ask you about um, what, what you were saying earlier about, you know, you talked about having good news, and that is good news, what you shared with us today, and some of the examples you gave us is great news. But um, when you are doing what you're talking about, is that more like a hospital-to-hospital -hospital communication, or do doctors have access, or does the general public, are they able to access what you're talking about? Uh, basically, the BTOP Arkansas E-Link program is the middle mile uh, project that we built as far as the healthcare system. So it is hospital to hospital, clinic to hospital, but we've made it in such a fashion that, uh, you know, they say, is there an app for that? Guess what? There's an app for that. So from my iPad, I can now have access to any of these institutions that we have, the hospitals, clinics that we have access to now over the video network to be able to see those patients, be able to, to have to talk to the hospital's uh, management and different things like that. One of the newest programs we're going to have is we have 11 hand surgeons across the state of Arkansas to handle all the trauma here. So our trauma is going to be one of our biggest uh, programs that's going to be built. So now they're going to have access wherever they are, doesn't matter if they're in state, out of state or whatever, but in state they'll have access to be able to evaluate those patients. At a patient level it's coming because there's thousands of mobile apps that are coming out every day. I'm a type 1 diabetic. If I need access to uh, help my health care provider, I'm going to be able to do it from my phone. There's going to be, and so that's kind of the, people call it the last mile uh, when it comes to electricity and all that. We consider this the first mile to the patient, and that's going to be the next largest growth that we see, I think, in the near future. Good. I was just at the VA up in Fayetteville, you know, and they've added a new wing up there, <clears throat> and they were showing us that, that the VA has this system now where I think some of it may be maybe iPad or, you know, tablet-based, some may be on a computer, and some of it they may actually have to give you a little device of some sort, I'm not quite sure. But um, it helps them provide just basic uh, services to veterans, and it could be things like blood pressure and weight and just some of your real basics, but it, the fact that you're saving the veteran the hours and hours of leaving their home wherever they are, usually fairly remotely, and getting into a place like the Fayetteville Hospital and do all that. You know, it's just, it's just a way to get efficiency. And, um, you know, it keeps a lot of uh, folks who don't need to be traveling in the stress of getting up and down and in and out. Uh, it just keeps them, you know, where they need to be. So, yeah, the technology is great. We would love to partner closer with the VA and expand our program here in the Arkansas. So instead of somebody from Mountain Homes having to travel to Fayetteville, they could actually receive that care there in Mountain Home because of the infrastructure we put in now. And we'd be more than happy to, to work with them on any level to be able to make sure our veterans get that care closer to home. That'd be great. Uh, let's see. Now, we, we have just a few more minutes with this panel, and I know we've covered a lot of ground. And I'm wondering if any of the panel want to, I'll say chime in, if they want to, um, you know, respond or... Uh, you know, say something about something they've heard or something they've thought of that either we haven't covered or would like to get your <laughs> thought on something. Anybody? Anybody have anything to add? All right, well, listen, what we'll do then is we'll swap out this panel and we'll let our next panel come up and our, our guys here are going <clears> to <throat> do that real quickly. Let me say thank you to all the panelists. And you all know this is the hearing, but we're going to continue to talk and we're going to continue to try to find ways to help you to make this reality and just get more and more of this all over Arkansas. So thank you very much for doing this and preparing and being here. And we'll get our team here to swap out the name tags and uh, or the, all that, and we'll, we'll move forward. Thank you.